My great-aunt had died the year before. Her house was locked up in probate until issues of inheritance were settled. My father was acting as caretaker of the property, which meant I took care of the place while my old man bought booths with my great-aunt's money. I didn't mind. It got me out of my place, away from my old man, and it made a nice place to have parties and hang out with my friends. My friend Chris loved the place. I think he also needed a place to hide. Somewhere away from his own house, with all of his dead mother's things lying around. Right where she left them, before a sleep-deprived truck driver snuffed out her life like a candle on a store-bought birthday cake. Our big plan was to host a Halloween party, just for our small group of friends. Chris quickly latched onto the idea of having a seance, and spent a lot of his time at the library. Or at some of the local bookstores, researching. I told him it was no big deal, that it was just a stupid party trick, but he insisted on getting it right. I guess Chris was messed up about his mother's death. I should have thought about that. About why he was so concerned with contacting the dead. But he didn't talk about her very much. And as I've said before, I was stupid. There are things that happen when you're 19 that stay with you. You don't think they will, but they do. If that's not the definition of haunted, I don't know what is. I met Chris as he was walking back from the dollar store that evening. He was carrying several bags of Halloween candy, some chips, and a few bottles of soda. He climbed into my car, and I drove us to the house. He dumped the candy into a large plastic bowl and smacked my hand away when I tried to filch some. That's for the trick-or-treaters, jerk, he said. As the afternoon faded into evening, the trick-or-treaters did show up, giggling in their Spider-Man and Incredible Hulk masks. I doled out candy while Chris ordered pizza and set up the food on the kitchen table. Pete, Liz, and Sophia arrived by eight. I was excited that Sophia had shown up. I had been crushing on her for months. But at 6'4", 140, and bright red curly hair, I looked like a scarecrow that tried to dress up like Ronald McDonald. Sophia was tiny. Cool. Beautiful with jet black hair and skin that may have never seen sunlight. She was my secret for having the party. I didn't stand a chance, but, well, I could hope. Liz was Pete's longtime girlfriend. She was almost as tall as me, with a shaved head, several piercings, and full sleeve tattoos on both arms. Now, I'm pretty smart, but Liz was a genius. She aced every exam without trying and was taking college-level classes in ninth grade. We had been friends for several years, and had shared several classes at high school, until she dropped out halfway through twelfth grade. The vice principal told her, in no uncertain terms, that she would not allow a tattooed freak like Liz to represent the school as valedictorian. Liz broke the woman's jaw in two places, and that was pretty much it for Liz's public education. Pete was wrecked when he walked through the door. I had been friends with Pete since we were toddlers. His mother had worked with mine at the same hospital before my mother left town. I loved Pete like a brother, but he had several bad habits. Self-destruction being high on the list. He nodded a hello, then staggered to the cabinet where my great-aunt kept her liquor, and liberated a bottle of peach schnapps. By nine, Pete had retired to the monstrous old red couch in the living room, cold cloth over his eyes and a bucket by his side. Why is he overindulging? I asked Liz, as we shoved the furniture out of the way. Chris and Sophia rolled up the large area rug, exposing the hardwood floor beneath. 
failed his driver's license exam, Liz said, rolling her eyes. Again? Chris said, brushing his thick brown hair out of his eyes. This is, what, his fifth time taking it? I thought they just gave it to you out of pity after five tries. At least you didn't vomit blueberry pancakes on the instructor's shoes like you did last time, Sophia had said. The heavy old grandfather clock in the living room bonged ten times. Chris stood up. Okay, everybody, let's get started. Liz tried to get Pete to join us, but he was fast asleep. Chris returned to the living room carrying a large wooden box. He opened the box and removed a small jar of salt and several candles. He motioned for us to sit in a circle, and he poured the salt in a double ring around us. He poured another, smaller double ring a few feet away, in front of the fireplace. He then carefully taped down several pieces of paper, onto which he had previously drawn strange geometric symbols. I took the candles and positioned them at points around the circles, then lit them with my zippo. Chris motioned for us to sit within the larger circle. He dimmed the lights and joined us. We took our positions around a small, wooden toolbox. The circle was small. When Sophia sat next to me, her knee touched mine. I tried to concentrate on something other than her perfume. Chris folded open the top and removed a metal bowl, which he placed onto a metal stand. He pulled some pieces of wood from the box, then put them in the bowl and lit them. He pulled a fabric-shrouded object from the box and placed it in front of him. The dark cloth revealed a book bound in black leather, and when Chris opened the yellow pages, instead of being brittle, they turned with an odd ease. Chris flipped through the pages, and when he stopped, the sour pages lay slackly open, without a hint of curling. He began a low chant, in a sing-song rhythm. While chanting, Chris dropped wads of dried herbs into the metal bowl. A heavy, acrid yellow smoke billowed up, stinging our eyes. Ancient spirits, Chris said as we stared at him with rapt attention. Ancient spirits, hear us. We beseech you, ancient spirits. Hear our call. Ancient spirits, hear us. Ancient spirits, answer us. Ancient spirits, come to us. Ancient spirits, the way is open. Ancient spirits, take this offering and come to us. Chris ran a scalpel, a scalpel that none of us had seen, across the palm of his hand. Liz recoiled back in shock. The blood sizzled as it met the flames in the bowl. Jesus, Chris, Sophia said. He hushed her with a glare. Ancient spirits, Chris called. Hear us. The way is open. Answer our... The doorbell chimed. We all jumped, including Chris. The doorbell chimed again. Through the door... We heard muffled voices call out, Trick or treat! Sophia huffed and rolled her eyes. Uh, the ancient spirits are here and they want candy. I thought you turned off the porch light. She stood up and walked to the door. She flipped on the porch light and opened the door. Two little kids were standing there, both dressed like witches, with pointy hats and green masks. They giggled, pillowcase sacks towards Sophia and yelled, Trick or treat! at the top of their lungs. Sophia looked around for the candy dish, then saw it on the kitchen table. It was empty, save for some wrappers. Sorry, kids, we're all out. That's what it means when the porch light's off. The kids looked at each other for a moment. Can we come inside for a minute, ma'am? My sister really has to go to the bathroom. 
Sophia nodded and stood aside as two little pointy witch hats bobbed past. As the shorter of the pair went to the bathroom, the taller one stood near the couch next to Pete. She said nothing and was very still. I found myself sneaking glances at her mask. It seemed far too elaborate for a child's mask, and the black pits that hid her eyes seemed to drink in the light. There was a crash from the hallway leading to the bathroom. Chris and I jumped to our feet and ran to see what had happened. The smaller of the two children kneeling at the entrance to the hallway. I'm really sorry. I broke the mirror on the wall. My hat is too big and it must have caught the frame and I tripped. I, I can't see where I'm going. She tilted her head down and began to cry softly. Uh, it, it's just a cheap old mirror, Chris said. He extended a hand, his cut hand, I thought to myself without really knowing why, and pulled her up. Mm, it's getting late. Your parents must be worried. Yes, it's almost midnight. Sister, we should be going! We turned to see the sister leaning over Pete's sleeping form, green mask pressed close to his ear. Hey, what are you doing to Pete? Liz asked. She stood and walked towards the taller child. He was sleeping, the taller witch said, shrugging. Her rubbery, pointed green nose bobbled. I was telling him to have sweet dreams. The two children left, clutching their pillowcase sacks and jostling each other as they walked down the sidewalk. I watched them go, and as I saw them turn the corner, I think that... I think that I may have seen both of them taking turns licking the smaller one's hand. We shut off the lights, bolted the front door, and relit a few candles that had gone out. Chris picked up his book again as we rejoined him inside the salt circle. Ancient spirits, hear us, he cried. Ancient spirits, we call you. Ancient spirits, hear our call. Ancient spirits, answer us. The old grandfather clock began to toll, the first of twelve. Chris sprinkled more sage into the redly glowing metal bowl. Ancient spirits, we beseech you. A candle went out. Sophia snorted and put her hand on mine. My heart slammed to a stop, then I realized she was only trying to pull the Zippo I had been fidgeting with out of my hand. She winked, then reached over to light the candle. Another candle went out. And another. The room was plunged into a murky darkness, only lit from the flickers of the coals in the metal bowl. Uh, okay, said Chris, with only a slight tremor in his voice. The ancient spirits have heard our call and have responded. He shifted slightly and closed the box. On the top of the box was an ornate inlay of letters and numbers, in the style of an Ouija board. Chris drew a small white planchette from his shirt pocket and beckoned for us to place our hands upon it. We moved the planchette on the board in a small, slow circle. Ancient spirits, are you here with us? Something crashed in the kitchen. I made as if to get up for it, and Chris motioned for me to stop. Don't leave the circle, he said. Stay inside the circle. Never break it. Nothing can harm you if you don't cross the boundary. We placed our hands back on the planchette. Ancient spirits, are you here with us? Chris asked again. The planchette slowly moved to a corner. Yes. Boards creaked in the darkened room around us. 
This is too spooky, Chris, Sophia said. It feels like something is watching us. It... Uh, oh. Sophia looked down. In the twitching red glow of the flames, a shadow seemed to spread across Sophia's chest. She looked up at us and opened her mouth to speak. A flood of blackness flowed out of her mouth and down her chin. She slumped forward, knocking over the metal bowl. The burning coals scattered. Sophia! I lunged toward her. A smoldering coal burned my hand, but I didn't feel it. I could only think about Sophia's beautiful hair, and how it was on fire. Get the lights! Chris yelled, standing. He shoved me off of Sophia and out of the circle. I scrambled to my feet. I could see nothing but the inky blackness. Liz was screaming, just over and over. A wall should have been inches away, but I felt nothing. I reached out frantically. My fingertips caught something. The, the sleeve of a shirt? It, it jerked away. There was a blinding, burning pain on my arm. I fell flat and away, clutching the wound. Blood soaked through the sleeve of my shirt. I crouched low, trying to see something, anything. I turned back to the circle. Liz's face, mouth open in surprise, jerked backward. Her slashed throat sprayed blood across the room. It smelled like copper. I turned to the right, arm out. I ran. My hand slammed into a doorway with force. A fingernail peeled back. I, I dropped to my knees, then crawled forward. My fingers met the cold steel of the refrigerator. I flung the door open. Light flooded the kitchen. I huddled in the corner, shaking. I heard a racking scream from the other room. Chris! I snatched a heavy cast iron frying pan from the stove. Heavy pan raised high. I stood to the side of the doorway. Blood trickled into a pool in the elbow of my shirt. I heard the slow slide of footsteps. There was a low, whispering breath. I was paralyzed. What if it was Chris? Or Sophia? Light glinted off of the butcher knife. I swung as hard as I could. My lips peeled back in a rictus grin. I grunted an involuntary, HA! The edge of the cast iron pan caved in Pete's face as if it were a Sunday morning egg. He went down in an untidy heap. I just kept swinging, bashing his head until it was a lumpy mess, until his body stopped twitching. Still clutching the pan, I ran for the front door. It took me an hour to reach the front door. The front door could not have been farther than 15 feet away, but it felt like miles. As I stumbled and crawled to the door, terrible things whispered to me, laughed at me, mocked me. I saw the dim shape scuttle away as I looked, eyes straining to see my attackers. They darted in and gouged my flesh with claws and hot, grasping hands. I flailed blindly in the dark with the frying pan, but they only laughed. When I did reach the door, it was locked. I smashed the antique, stained glass with a blow, then climbed through it, lacerating my hands and arms more in the process. The police report states that Peter McCalty, a 19-year-old Caucasian male, had several priors, including vandalism and possession, was under the influence of a large amount of controlled substances. Traces of Adderall, Exifor, PCP, Psilocybin, and certain other unidentified substances experienced a psychotic break and killed several people. Initially, I was suspect number one. The police officer found me walking down the middle of the street, covered in blood and bleeding from several dozen cuts fist clenched tightly around a cast iron pan. 
The police took a dim view of my story, and once it wasn't determined that drugs had been involved, they ignored it completely. As far as the cops were concerned, a bunch of kids took some acid on Halloween. They played at a satanic ritual, then one went off his rocker and killed a few of the others. It happens every Halloween. I was remanded into psychiatric custody for two weeks. It was only after I was released that I found out that the police had only recovered three bodies, not four. They never found Chris, or any trace of him. I have never gone back to that house. I think about going back every night. I take my meds. Meds that make me forget. Mostly to suppress the whispers that I hear in those long, black hours before dawn. But sometimes, I still hear them. Every night as Halloween approaches, the voices get louder. Even if I up my dose. They tell me terrible things. They tell me it was my fault. They tell me I was the one with the knife. Okay, all Evil Black Bunny here. That was The Witches and the Circle by Chris Dodd. And, oh boy. Prepare to hear me complain a bit. This story had potential, but there were, at the same time, too many details and not enough. There were too many details about things that didn't really matter, and not enough about the things that did. We got very brief descriptions of the people involved, which was okay. That's good. I don't need to know about every freckle on someone's face. We got a good description for the women involved, but we didn't get much for the men. All I know about Chris is that he has a lot of brown hair. I know next to nothing about Pete, but I can tell you that Liz is tall, shaven, and has arm sleeves. I can also tell you that is tiny and beautiful with long black hair and pale skin. But I can tell you next to nothing about Pete. Pete, who ends up killing everybody, supposedly, we get no details for other than he has substance abuse issues and is dating Liz. I think. That's another thing. A lot of parts of this story weren't very clear. There was unfortunately some serious focus on spelling things out for people. Like, we had a whole paragraph explaining that Chris wanted to do a seance, and he wanted to do it properly. You could have left that out, and have just had it be a surprise that he brought a box, where did he even get the box, the planchette, the burning stuff in the bowl, the shapes and all that shit. You didn't have to foreshadow all of that with him being super serious about a seance. He, it could have been a surprise and that might have been way more shocking. Oh my god, Chris, what are you doing? A seance. It would have been a lot more shocking if he had gone overboard and nobody really expected it to be that bad. They may have just thought, uh, oh, he might bring a candle and some Ouija board, I don't know. But nope, he went all out, including blood sacrifice, which is pretty fucked up. Then we get to the two witches. Alright, interesting. Summoning the spirits when they show up as two children in witch masks. Not bad. The bad part? Describing how you saw the two witches licking the blood-covered hand after they left. We didn't need to know that! That is completely spelling out what is going on to us, and that, and that ruins certain aspects of the horror genre. Don't tell us everything. Give us enough hints that we can come up with the conclusion on our own. That's a lot more terrifying when you're left alone to think. Now some of the good points. The violence wasn't overdone. The writing is solid enough that the story can hold up to it. But again, the focus on details was on the wrong details. There was too much description for this and not enough for that. Also, why did it have to be the narrator's dead aunt's house? Like seriously, it would have made more sense, at least to me, if the house that the seance was being done in was Chris's mother's house. 
Chris lost his mom. She's dead. It would have made a lot more sense if he was trying to contact her in the house that she died in. Where does the dead aunt from the narrator come into play at all other than it being an old house? Sure, it's creepy, but sometimes a homey atmosphere can make things even worse when shit hits the fan. Alright, The Witches and the Circle is not good, but it's not bad. It's one of those middle-of-the-road things where you read it and then you maybe remember some of the really good parts, but everything else is a shitty blur. That doesn't mean the story is bad. It just means that it needs work. I consider this a really, really rough draft. And I think, if Chris Dodd doesn't want to strangle me if he ever hears this, if he went over it again and fixed some of the problems that I mentioned, or even just fixed some of the issues, this could be a really nice, really solid story. But that's just me. Hi! I don't just yammer into a microphone, but I also write my own stuff, and sometimes, if I'm brave enough, I narrate it for your listening pleasure. So click the link over there if you want to hear me yammer some more. Or if you just want to skip that part and give me your soul, click over here and subscribe. Trust me, it doesn't hurt as much as people say. Special thanks to that creepy reading for allowing me to guest spot on his channel. It was a lot of fun. Good night!